Welcome to a special edition of Transit Unplugged. I'm your host, Paul Comfort, and today we have a number of guests who will be discussing transit agencies' response to the coronavirus or COVID-19. This has been a topic which has uh, transformed our industry in just a matter of weeks. And so we brought on a number of executives from transit agencies around North America and the world to address it. They include Gary Rosenfeld, CEO of the Memphis Area Transit Authority, who talks from their response from a mid-sized city, Nicole Fontaine Bardwell, who is Executive Vice President, Chief Administrative Officer of the Dallas Area Rapid Transit, talks about their response from a major transit system perspective. Uh, Dr. Robert Bob Schneider is executive director of OmniRide, who operates local and commuter service in the Washington, D.C. suburbs. So he talks about how that's being affected, commuters, trains, and buses. And then we talk to Alan Hunter, who is the executive director of the Texas Transit Association, regarding statewide responses. We've also talked to Tracy Lowen, who is the access manager for Saskatoon Transit, and we wanted her to give us, and she did give us, a response of how paratransit is being affected and what's happening overall in Canada. And we also talked to Yale Wong, a research associate from the Institute of Transport and Logistics Studies in Sydney, Australia, who put out a great article on the worldwide transit responses to COVID-19, especially what they were doing in China. Now, again, as you know, this is for informational purposes only. The information here, it's not specific advice to anyone on how or what to do at your transit system. It's a fast-changing situation. By the time you listen to this recording, uh, which is being made the week of March 16th, the information and what's happening in your city or state may have changed dramatically. And even the, the guests we had, the situation that's changing, the situation in their city may have changed. And so this is just an overall look at how transit systems are responding from executives to kind of share information among all transit agencies and people who are interested in transit to see how we're responding. Public transit remains an important bastion of economic development and security for cities and nations. And it must remain paramount that it continue to operate well and function even in a situation such as this pandemic. These people tell you what they're doing in their cities and their states. What does it mean to be a successful public transit agency? What are you doing to lead the way? It's time to learn from the top transit professionals in North America. This is Transit Unplugged with your host, Paul Comfort. Hi, this is Paul Comfort, and welcome to a special edition of Transit Unplugged. This special episode is focused on the coronavirus contagion that is spreading across America and the world and transit's response to it. And I'm excited to have as our first guest today, my good friend and CEO of the Memphis Area Transit Authority, Gary Rosenfeld, who I'm talking to today from his office in Memphis. Gary, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for uh, asking me to be a part of this. Yep. So I've been talking to a number of CEOs and chief safety officers over the last week, and transit systems across North America now are are ramping up a lot of efforts to make sure their systems are clean and also communicating to the public. You know, some of them are saying travel in off-peak times, like New York City mayor was saying, and other people are making other statements. Tell us what's happening in Memphis. What kind of preparations you're taking there in this in Music City, USA? Well, we are. Uh watching everything very closely. Uh, the Shelby County area here has uh, only two confirmed cases of, of uh, COVID-19 and uh, they came from out of the area. So there's not yet any evidence of community spread here, which is really good news for our community. In terms of preparations for this, you know, our operations are continuing to run at uh, uh, full speed. We've seen no uptick in, in any type of absenteeism or anything that would affect the service in that way. We've had a team of uh, subject matter experts, if you will, working on this for about the last two weeks in terms of preparing the plan. Uh, we'd, we'd much rather be responding to a plan rather than just a, a knee-jerk response to some news headline. So the plan has uh, gone through all of our processes, how we clean, what we clean, when we clean. It's set up trigger points for when processes are in- increased in frequency And uh, it has also set in motion things like uh, our spring cleaning efforts got got a, uh, you know, we we started that a month early so that we could get in there, really clean our facilities from from the wintertime 
and then uh, sanitize them properly. And then we'll just keep going with the additional sanitizing efforts that, that uh, we should be doing given the situation. And what's your messaging to the public there in Memphis about riding transit? We're good to go. Again, with no community spread yet identified in Memphis, we're, we're good to go. You know, the bulk of our ridership really doesn't have a choice. Our riders don't have cars to go to or turn to. And we have not seen a lot of uh, businesses that are not entertainment related or, or sports related making any type of adjustments to their work schedules. Some businesses are actually a, a lot busier. We have a big uh, medical industry here in, in Memphis, as well as a, a big shipping hub is Memphis as well. Oh, so, right. You've got, you've got FedEx there. Yes. Yes. And, and they're actually ramping up services because from what I understand, I, uh, that, that since the airlines are not carrying or not making trips internationally, uh, FedEx is unaffected by that. So they are picking up the, the cargo volume that was being uh, handled by airlines. So it's probably a good thing for them. But nonetheless, it, it still requires that, that uh, they do some planning and they do some, some uh, careful monitoring of the situation. And that's an organization that does that very well to begin with. So yeah. I'm sure that they'll, they'll do that quite well. But as for MATA, you know, uh, we have not seen a drop off in ridership. Okay. We have not seen a, uh, like I said, an increase in absenteeism. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we laid out this plan that has trigger points that will have us take certain steps that will uh, ensure the safety of our passengers and our, uh, and our employees. One of the big things that, that I need to do as the general manager and, and chief executive is to keep everybody aware that we'll get through this. And this is a problem, yes, but it's not an insurmountable problem. And as long as we keep our wits about us, we will keep our employees and our, and our passengers safe. It will be inconvenient at times, but for the most part, everybody's attitude is good. It's positive, And we just uh, hope that we're able to you know, continue to get the message out that, it, yes, it's safe to ride public transportation and that you can rely on us. Very good. Well, thank you, Gary. I appreciate that. And, and I'm sure you have a plan in place if, it, uh, if the contagion spreads and gets worse and you start having community contact uh, where, it, where it transitions from person to person like it has here in Maryland? Yes. We're part of the, you know, the leadership team of both the city and county. So we're right there with up to the minute information, if you will. And um, yes, we do have plans on how we would uh, change services given if there was a hotspot identified in the community, we uh, are prepared with not just how service might change, but also we created a heat map of our, all of our employees. So if all of a sudden uh, an area where a lot of our employees is heavily affected, we we will be able to recognize that and adjust service accordingly if if they're not able to come to work because of any type of a quarantine. Oh, that's well, very that's interesting. So the plan is pretty detailed and I'm pretty proud of my team that's been putting it together. We just hope that, you know, 99% of this plan will will reside in a book on a shelf without being used. I think we're prepared and, and uh, I think that the community is uh, appreciative of that. Very good. Gary Roosevelt, CEO of the Memphis Area Transit Authority, thanks so much for sharing with us your plans and preparation and how you respond to the coronavirus threat. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. All right, welcome to the next part of our special edition of Transit Unplugged. This one focused on the coronavirus and transit's response to it around the country. And today I'm excited to have with us on the line Nicole Fontaine Bartowell, who is Executive Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer of Dallas DART, the big transit system in the heart of Texas. Nicole, thanks so much for having, uh, for being on the show with us today to talk about this important topic. Well, thank you, Paul. Glad to be able to be here. Tell us about just generally what's happening in Dallas when it comes to the coronavirus and what your response has been. So in general, uh, you know, we have had uh, confirmed cases. Actually, the, the county judge has announced a, you know, a, health, a public health emergency. But even before that, DART was uh, gearing up. First of all, it's important to note that as a public transit agency, uh, we have protocols for sanitizing and disinfecting all of our facilities and rolling stock on a regular basis. And unfortunately, we do have to deal with biohazards on a regular basis. So we have those protocols 
already in place. And what we're doing now is to increase the frequency of those cleanings and just making sure that we are intensifying uh, efforts uh, as necessary uh, you know, uh, uh, across our system. And have you noticed, uh, has there been an impact uh, let's start first on your employees. Have you noticed any, you know, employees, mechanics, drivers, other groups, any impact on their attendance? Or are you still having good attendance there? We're still having good attendance. Okay. Uh, and, and we're thankful for that. We have uh, instituted a daily uh, communications to our employees or more frequently just as information is becoming available and, and responding to their questions. Good. How are you communicating to drivers? Have you set up a hotline or website or what, how are you communicating to them about things? So we have um, uh, a number of channels. We, of course, have provided email. We have our uh, intranet that's uh, available in the, uh, in the yards. We also have digital dashboards that are available uh, and that we're using. <clears throat> and we have cards card stock that, that we are, have printed and we're putting them in the hands of our employees. We initially started with just uh, putting them right next to the, the sign-in uh, station, but we found that some employees they still would miss it, and so we, we really have asked the supervisors now to make sure they're putting it directly in the employee's hands. Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. That's good. And is there um, in the in the vehicle cleaning department and there uh, in the maintenance department any issues there, or are things going um, as you're planning them? No, things things are going well. I, I think uh, our challenge, like uh, everyone else's, is uh, just pro making sure that we have uh, sufficient supplies. And uh, our our procurement department has has worked very very uh, well, and uh, they've been able to source. Uh, all of the supplies that are, are required. So, so we're, we're in good shape. That's excellent. And what's the, um, what's the response been in the community? Has there been any decrease in ridership over the last couple of weeks as the intensity of media coverage surrounding the coronavirus has increased? We haven't seen any uh, measurable change in ridership. We have the uh, St. Patrick's Day parade that was just canceled. Now, now that will really hurt us from a ridership perspective because it is one of our heaviest days for transit. So that, that will impact us. I think as more employers um, begin to ask people to work from home and other events are being canceled, I expect that we will see an impact. I know that transit systems, having been a former CEO myself and working the business for many years, most transit systems have plans in place for crises like this. Were you all able to kind of dust off your old plan and kind of just tweak it, or did you have to more start from scratch, or uh, how is this compared to other responses of, or other protocols with, you know, other crises that you've had to endure there at DART? So we have a, a, a standard process for uh, contingency planning, and, and we have that on um, a reg regular schedule. Uh, we also exercise various types of scenarios, and we, we really started with the uh, uh, looking at the protocols that were put in place for the uh, uh, Ebola and the uh, the SERS. Okay. Because the agency had plans from those uh, uh, events. That makes sense. That's good. And so what do you see going forward? Do you have, um, uh, you know, plans going forward? It doesn't sound like it's impacted you too much now, but if it, could, if it continues, they're saying we may have another month or whatever of uh, before it completely peaks. Um, you have plans in place to address that if you do start seeing uh, a, a bigger impact? Uh, yes, we do. And, and, uh, and, and those are continuing to evolve as well. We, I mean, we mapped out a framework. So, what we're in right now is, is a level one, you know, moving into level two with a public health declaration by the, the county judge. So that means that, that we're canceling meetings in our uh, facilities and offices. Our contractors are working remotely, for example. And uh, then there would be level three, which if 
the county judge or mayor of uh, any of our uh, entities where we provide service, if they take it up to, you know, an isolation or quarantine, then, you know, we'll have to have the, re- the appropriate response. So you as the chief administrative officer, you oversee a lot of the, I guess, all of the administrative functions there, right? Like HR, finance, IT, those kind of things? Uh, except for the, the CFO reports to Gary, the okay. CEO. Mm-hmm. But and yes, so, I have the others. Okay, so what's the plan like like you said if there was if there was to be a place where they say okay, people need to stop coming to work, do you have a plan in place uh like many agencies do for people to work from home if possible? That is something that is under consideration. We we have been an organization that that likes that that presence, but we are working through a scenario where people would not be able to come to work to the gotcha. building. Yeah, And I guess the last question is, has there been any interaction? Uh, you all have unions there, right? Has there been any interactions with them on this? And what's their take on things? Oh, yes. Yes, we do have uh, the ATU. And they've been really good uh, to work with. We've uh, had regular meetings and updates with them. They have the same concerns that we have about right. uh, our employees. And we've made it clear that our employees and our, our number one uh, concern, Gary made that clear in a presentation to the board earlier this week. And so, you know, we're taking all steps that we can to make sure that our employees are informed and that we can uh, maintain to the best of our ability a safe and healthy workplace. That's great. Yeah, you, we've mentioned Gary a couple times. Gary Thomas is the uh, CEO there and one of the most respected CEOs in the country. So you said he made a presentation to the board on all this? Yes, he did. And how did that go? It went well. It went well. Uh, he was able to articulate to the board the work that we were doing, the framework for our response. And, uh, you know, we had uh, a few questions of clarification, but uh, it went well. That's great. Well, very good. Well, we wish you the very best, Nicole, as you continue to uh, respond to this. We know that public transit is open and available for people to use. It sounds like in Dallas, and you all are um, cleaning and keeping the system as clean and comfortable and safe as, uh, as you can. Yes, we are. Very good. Thanks so much for sharing with us today. As so many of our listeners are interested to see uh, how public transit is stepping up and responding to make sure that the 35 million people a day that ride here in the U.S., can continue to use mass transit. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, we're on to the next part of our special Transit Unplugged episode dealing with the COVID-19 or coronavirus issue. Happy to have on the line today, Dr. Bob Schneider, who is uh, Executive Director of OmniRide in Northern Virginia. Dr. Bob, thanks for being with us. Absolutely. And to be clear, I'm not the doctor that can help you with this. That's right. Okay. <laughs> yes, I can, I can help explain the primaries, but I cannot help you with your... Uh, viral infections. I got you. Okay. Well, uh, speaking of viral infections, tell us what's happening in the, in the Northern Virginia, Washington, D.C. area when it comes to this and what's the response of transit. Tell people about your transit system first a little bit and what you do and how much, you know, basically you're serving our nation's capital with so many of the employees there and talk about the impact it's having. Certainly. I think really describing the environment, our operating environment for what we call the DMV or the D.C. area is practically from Baltimore to halfway to Richmond, when you think about it. And so we're talking, you know, 40 miles in any direction is the, from DC downtown is our operating environment. And I'm on the Southern end of that out of Prince William County, sorry for the ding, Prince William County. And we have a fleet of about 165 buses. Our operating environment also includes VRE, the Virginia Railway Express. We have the famous commuter train, commuter train, uh, Fairfax Connector, we've got Alexandria Dash, Arlington Art, and Metro, which is commonly known as WMATA. So you have Metro bus as well as the Metro train system. And then coming in from the Maryland side, you've got Mark, which is the commuter train for Maryland, plus all the, the systems in that area. So it's, it's a very transit-rich operating environment, and we have a series of major interstates pouring into D.C. every day commuter issues are our number one issue. So my system, for example, where I'm at an Omniride, we have 165 buses and about 100 of them are MCI commuter type coaches. And our focus is taking the roughly 9,000 commuters that we serve into DC and they're predominantly the federal workforce. Our origins are about 
10 different park and ride lots that have about 10,000 spaces. And our destinations are the White House, State Department, Pentagon, LaFont Plaza, et cetera. So right. the, that, that is what we do. And the big issue has been with the coronavirus, what is the federal government doing? And what we've started to see is the different telework policies have started to be put in place, but it's not consistent. It's department by department. So the response has been not really wait and see or watch and see. It's prepare and wait for what the federal government's really going to do for the workforce. And that's been our big issue. We've all been tracking what's happening in Seattle and San Francisco transit systems. But right now in the past 24 hours, we've had school districts close for a month or three weeks. Uh, Federal agencies are basically saying, you know, liberal telework policy, minimize the commute issues. But one of the things we're going to face is should this work its way into the workforce and you start having transit systems have employees impacted that, that are, you know, found to have the, the virus, will the CD shut down that transit agency? That's one of the questions we've got. And we just don't know because we haven't really had that experience yet. But what we have been doing, I think, is really important Starting about six weeks ago, we, we as a system, and I know WMATA, Metro has been doing this, VRE has been doing it. We started about six weeks ago with the enhanced cleaning. I think a lot of people in the industry did. It was also flu season, so it made a whole heck of a lot of sense. But we put a lot more emphasis on, we thought it would be a flu season issue and pushed hard on the personal health hygiene, the sanitizers at, at, in January. So it's really helped us, but we've focused on wiping down the bus interiors, you know, enhanced cleaning. We're now bringing in a a crew on the weekends and doing more enhanced daily cleaning, hospital grade cleaners and enhanced cleaning over weekends, focusing on the facility, the obvious stuff, door handles, things like that. But what's really, I think, separated for how we might normally react to this is we've asked our employees to be the solution drivers. Typically management sits around the table and makes decisions what I have seen is the leadership in the region has asked the workforce to solve the problem. What do you need to work from home? And we've started experimenting over the past couple of weeks. And it's been, it's been excellent response. It's been coordination. Uh, literally five minutes before we, we started this podcast, I was on the phone with Rich Dalton, who's the acting CEO of VRE, coordinating what we're doing because the coordination relationship and we're our peers to the north at the Northern Virginia Transit Commission, Kate Matice, is executive director. I was c- communicating with her. The other big thing that's going to affect us is public meetings. Virginia has some pretty restrictive public meetings requirements for call-ins and can you have electronic meetings. So that's a governance thing that we weren't really thinking of. I know we've had great guidance from APTA as well as FTA on the important things like coordinating with the county health departments and things like that, that's pretty straightforward. But now it's time to start thinking about governance and how are we going to make sure we get things like payroll taken care of and health insurance taken care of if, if we could be locked out of our building per se for 21 days. And that's been the focus is how do we keep continuity and make sure our employees are taken care of. That's very comprehensive review. I appreciate that. So this coronavirus you know, obviously, it's a, it's a new strain of the flu bug, uh, uh, another type of corona that's, that's a novel one. But uh, most transit agencies already had in place or have in place continuity you know, coop plans, as they call them. Are you basically just dusting off your existing coop plan and tweaking it? Or are, is this so unique and novel that it's requiring kind of a whole new approach? We're not even dusting off the plan. Uh, as a system in the Northeast, we have the, the emergency service plan, the snow plan. We have the plan for when I-95 has a tractor trailer turnover on it and everything grinds to a complete halt or the cherry blossom festival or the Christmas tree lighting where the city is in a complete lockdown. So what we've done is not really dusted off the ESP, our emergency service plan, but we've put in some triggers for it. And then we also have our other tiers of service, which we might call them, because we're so commuter driven, we have what we call the modified holiday service, which is just local service with a couple of routes to go up to the Washington DC metro stations, which are located about 15, 20 miles outside of downtown DC. 
The advantage of being commuter driven is when we have major snow events, we can shut down pretty easily. So we have some practice doing this because we're in the commuter world. So pulling those plans, the difference is usually it's just wet, it's weather driven or event driven and it's over quick. This is a case where we're going to have to monitor ridership. When is it coming back? When is it starting up? And we're not just looking at the weather. We're having to pay attention to maybe a hundred different agencies, plus the Office of Personnel Management, plus what are corporations doing. Just this afternoon, Washington, D.C. Metro announced that they're going into their next tier of service preparation with less frequent trains. So that even affects how we can approach business in terms of planning. So we are all having, you can have a plan, but your plan has to be a little bit adjustable to the left or to the right, so to speak, to match what the other systems in the region are doing. That makes a lot of sense, especially in an area where you have so many regional services coming in together. Tell me about how it's affecting contractors. I know that you have some of your service contracted out with a private contracting company. Are you having you know regular interactions with them as to whether or not they're gonna have enough employees to cover service, et cetera? Yes, and that's one of the other parts of that emergency service plan is that when you have that more simplified approach, you can be more flexible with the workforce. Um, You know, we hate to always drop a trip, but if you're advertising, we're just going to take you from point A to point B, and everyone's going to go from A to B every 20 minutes. Well, you have a few drivers drop out. Well, now it becomes every 30. It's not the end of the world. It's much, much harder for the either a smaller system or a local system that every route is a different part of the city where it's a little easier for us. And we are working very closely with First Transit. They're obviously a national company. They've got experience and resources, and they're really focused on making sure their employees are comfortable and with what we're doing and knowledgeable with what we're doing. From the contract side, you know, there's always the contract provision where if, if you do run or don't run, those are all different scenarios that we'll have to work through. We've got contract provisions, but one thing that's been very helpful is FTA has been supportive and said, hey, let us know where you're going to see revenue losses or you know, fare losses, things like that. And I understand today that President Trump has authorized the emergency services provisions, so there's access to relief there. So hopefully it won't impact us too much, but you know, it's, it's, going, to be tr- it's going to be tough with contract provisions and you know, things like waiving liquidated damages because it's not, it's not like you didn't hire enough operators. It's right. to have a virus. So it's being smart about those kinds of things and realizing that right now it's an all, all hands on deck, not just in our industry, but in our community and to making sure that we are prepared and responsive for our employees and our customers so that, that our community can be proud of what we did. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Schneider. We appreciate uh, your leadership on this issue in the Washington, D.C. area, making sure that our transit, especially on the commuter side, people that are actually servicing our national government, which is so important at a time like this, are, are being served well and they have a, a safe ride into the city. Absolutely. There's, there's The one thing about working up here is the tremendous pride that we keep America moving. And that's, you. you it's unbelievable to, the the impact that we have on on the nation just from a few miles away. So thanks, Paul. Thank you. All right, we're ready to move on to our next part of our special Transit Unplugged episode where we're talking to leaders in the transit industry from around North America regarding the impact of the coronavirus or uh, COVID-19 and how that's impacting transit and how transit's responding. And so I'm excited to have on the line today, Alan Hunter, who is the uh, executive director of the Texas Transit Association, who's actually just been on a call with all the transit companies around Texas about this very topic. Alan, thanks for being with us. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having me, Paul. Yep. So tell us, how is, uh, how is COVID-19 affecting Texas transit systems? And just in general, what is their response? Well, you know, it's, it's affecting Texas like it is, you know, everyone else across the nation and, and, and actually across the world. Today, our governor actually declared a statewide emergency. And matter of fact, just a few minutes ago, the president actually just declared a national emergency. So, you know, I, I'd like to say that uh, all this, the transit agencies across the state of Texas are responding very well, despite the, the challenges that, that we're dealing with. On the call you just had, where you had uh, many of your transit system executives, what were some of the concerns they raised and how are they addressing them? Well, you know, Paul, a lot of questions that were brought up today with some of the other folks 
it was really just a discussion to with, with uh, a lot of the metros to discuss how this is affecting us and, and kind of how we're responding. And some of the things that came out, I mean, and I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that, 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 that all the agencies here in Texas have been doing a wonderful job in, in terms of cleaning and sanitizing their vehicles and stations. So that's something that's been happening for, for, you know, many years now. So for, for, so for us in the transit industry, that, that wasn't something we were not familiar with, but a lot of the agencies have taken it upon themselves to provide what I would call enhanced cleaning measures and, uh, and in some regards, we've got some of the larger metros that, in, that I, in my opinion, are setting the standards for uh, what it takes uh, to respond to something like this. So a lot of when I say enhanced cleaning and, and sanitization, basically it's 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 a more rigorous cleaning of the vehicles to where they're doing it um, you know, at a much higher level than, than what they would typically do. That includes stations, stops, everything. Some of them are actually pulling the vehicles off and doing it more frequently. So it's not just waiting to the end of the day. They're pulling these vehicles off and doing it periodically throughout the day. Uh, in some cases, agencies are issuing per- per- personal protective equipment like gloves and hand sanitizers or wipes. Some cases, uh, some agencies are placing hand sanitizing stations on buses or in stations. And uh, of course, um, a lot of public notices and things like that. One of the, the big concerns that uh, did come out of conversation is, you know, one of the recommendations is having, you know, is, is, is having people keep a distance of six feet away from other passengers or other people. Now, in mass transit, obviously, that's a challenge. So one of the, the topics of discussion today was in public transportation, how do we keep that distance of six feet away from our pra- uh, passengers and still meet the demand of uh of daily ridership. And so that's one of the things that is a statewide position. We'll be kind of looking at to see how that impacts us and how that would reduce the ridership. But that's something that a lot of agencies really hadn't thought about till recently. Yeah, the social distancing aspect of it. Are any of them noting, I know it's, it's, um, it hasn't spread that much in Texas at this point, my understanding is, but are any of them noting, you know, a turn down in the number of drivers or mechanics or staff? I, you know, that's one of the things, talking to several agencies today, a lot of the agencies are monitoring these things on almost a daily basis. And right now, that has, you know, it's a concern, obviously, for everybody, you know, especially when you look at just the availability of CDL drivers in general. But, but right now, staffing hasn't been an issue. I mean, of course, it's a concern for everyone, but right now, everyone is just monitoring it very closely. One of the things that has come up is, you know, obviously, we're starting to we're working with our agencies to start trying to track, and we haven't tracked it yet, but we're soliciting this information. So I'm hoping very soon we'll have some statistical data in terms of what the loss of passenger revenue and fare, fare box collections is starting to look like. Um, most of the folks that we spoke to today are experiencing some losses, you know, from anywhere from, say, you know, 20 to 30 percent right now, just, and it depends on the different services. Right. And of course, uh, it's it's you know we're right here at spring break, so for the agencies that depend on tourism and stuff like that, and for the agencies that get some sort of tax revenue, you know a lot of agencies are starting to see a decrease in some of that. And we're talking in in, in the cases of millions of dollars. Yeah, well, and you've had some big events canceled there, right? South by Southwest and the Houston Rodeo. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean South by Southwest brings in. You know, I think in excess of three hundred million dollars to the city, and of course the the Houston Rodeo. I think this is the first time it's ever been canceled, and so so what we're experiencing now is certainly unprecedented. Yeah, I was looking forward to coming out and speaking at the Texas Transit Association conference. That's a topic we haven't talked about yet to any guests. So you, like many people, have had to cancel your conference. I mean, I know I had. Uh, six conference cancellations that I was planning to speak at uh, and do book signings for my new book, The Future of Public Transportation, that have canceled over the next few months. So tell us about that decision-making process and how that's impacting things. Well, one, we didn't cancel it. We we just postponed it. Now, at the end of the day, we may end up having to cancel it, but we are looking at dates to anywhere between June and, and October to see if, we, if it's possible to reschedule it. Do you know how much work goes into scheduling an event like this? And and then trying to push it back a few months to reschedule it is it's a it's a tremendous task. And so, I mean, it ultimately may need to be canceled at some point. But again, that's not our intention. When you're in a time where your NBA sporting events or NCAA sporting events are, are canceling, and like like we said, Houston is 
is canceling their event with the rodeo. Um, Austin's canceling South by Southwest. For us to continue on with our event, we felt like it would have been irresponsible. And, and not just to mention that, there once uh, the World Health Organization had come out with their statement and once the president had canceled flights over to, um, to the European countries, at that point, several agencies throughout the state of Texas and even uh, several of the vendors and associate members that we work with started imposing 30-day travel bans on any non-essential travel. So had we elected to go ahead and continue with the event, it probably would have been poorly attended as a result of some of these travel bans. Yeah, I noticed that too. I was uh, supposed to speak at the Boston Smart Transit Conference and uh, you know, it was going to be just a vendor conference, I think, because so many of the agencies have had those travel bans put in. So of course they postponed as well. I think they're moving to August and uh, other conferences like Comotion Miami has moved into, I think, June timeframe, the end of June, early summer. So that's what a lot of people are having to do. If they're not canceling, they're at least postponing. But it also talks about, I think the last thing I want to ask you about is the importance of a state association during a time like this, when it is kind of a novel situation. I mean, they call it the novel coronavirus, but it's a novel situation that we haven't really had that I recall in 30 years in this industry where we've had this much of an impact on things with a virus like this with so many things canceling. It's important for transit agencies to have a venue in which they can discuss these together, right? And kind of compare notes. Absolutely. I mean, like today, uh, you know, kind of what sparked this conversation today, uh, our friends with Houston Metro had reached out to us. Uh, they had some concerns and they, they, felt like, you know what, we're not the only ones that have this concern. So uh, after talking to them, they felt like, you know, you know, Alan, can you set up this meeting with all the agencies, all the metro agencies here in the state? And so literally in less than a 24-hour period, we were able to get everybody, you know, all the metro agencies on board for a brief phone call today to kind of share best practices and concerns and challenges and some of the cost concerns. And so it was, it was extremely beneficial to get us all on the same page. And now these calls are going to become weekly. And so that's just one example of how working through your state association is how we can kind of pull our resources together. And the other thing, too, is we've had several of the smaller agencies and the rural systems reach out to me for direction and, and some guidance as to how we can help them. And, of course, as you know, we're, we're monitoring these situations daily. And as information comes out, we get this out to our members. We, we have the ability to get news out to about 1,400 transit professionals throughout the state of Texas almost instantaneously. So as this information changes, we get this information out as soon as we can. That's wonderful. Anything else you want to share from today's call or in general on the topic? Well, you know, just the other thing that had come out was, you know, as good a job as all of our agencies are doing, the one common denominator that everybody was starting to experience is the uh, the, the availability of cleaning supplies. You know, we all order this stuff in bulk, and what we're finding is a lot of the agencies are having to get a lot more creative in terms of how they are, you know, where, where they're finding this this uh, material or maybe finding different material that does the same things. Just because, you know, when, when you run into this kind of a situation, everybody runs to to deplete these supplies. And so that's one of the things that a lot of folks are finding. Um, even uh, like Corpus Christi, Corpus Christi had to get very creative and they did a joint purchase with multiple agencies to buy stuff in bulk and they're buying stuff in, in much bigger supplies than they typically would. And of course, now one of the challenges they've got to figure out is how they're going to divvy this up between the three agencies. Okay. But uh, but again, it just shows how people are getting creative and and uh, even speaking with some of our friends in DART, you know, they're having to look at uh, some of their procurement practices so that uh, they can acquire the necessary material that they need. So it's it's uh, it's caused us all to be a little bit more uh, flexible, a little bit more creative, and get outside the box to solve some of these challenges. Yeah, and I think everything's going to be very clean when this is all done, isn't it? Oh, that's right. I mean, that's uh, get used to the smell of cleaning material right now because I think uh, it's something that we're all going to get very used to smelling. But the one thing that's really coming out of this too is it's given all the agencies a chance to reflect on their policies and, and, and really tighten things up and just better prepare for what we're doing now, which I think will ultimately better prepare us for the future. Excellent. What a great way to close the interview. Thank you so much, Alan Hunter, Executive Director of the Texas Transit Association, one of the largest associations in the country, representing a number of the major cities that our country has and and helping kind of review what's happening across a big state like Texas in response to coronavirus.
This is our next guest on Transit Unplugged on our special edition focused on COVID-19 or the coronavirus and the response of transit agencies to it. We're taking a look across North America and the world today, seeing how transit agencies are responding. And as we know, things are changing uh, day by day. Transit agencies are um, are coming into all kinds of different uh, situations. And so by the time you hear this, it may have changed even more. But this is where it stands this week on the week of the 16th, uh, where it stands now. We're with Tracy Lowen, who is Access Transit Manager for Saskatoon Transit in the Transportation and Construction Department in the city of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan in Canada. How are you doing, Tracy? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Paul. Good. Thanks for uh, being a guest with us today on Transit Unplugged. So tell us in particular, so I've talked to an agency head that's for a large suburban agency that runs commuter train and commuter bus here in America, and I've talked to uh, the senior vice, executive vice president of Dallas, a big city, and we've talked to a smaller city, Memphis, but we've been focused a lot on fixed route transit, and I wanted to talk to someone from the paratransit world, which is your world, and also someone from Canada. So tell us generally what's happening there at Saskatoon Transit, and in particular, what's happening with the paratransit service as it stands today. Certainly. So here in Saskatoon, a lot of our direction is coming from our emergency measures organization. That was activated, I believe, on Thursday or Friday of last week. And as a result, we are seeing a lot of our facilities being shut down. Our leisure centers have been shut down. Our libraries have been shut down and closed. The university has closed uh, effective Friday. I believe it was all of their classes are going to online classes on Thursday. So we're seeing that in paratransit in particular, well, and in transit in general, we aren't going to have the same volume of customers and volume of ridership. So right now, it's status quo for our our uh, drivers and for our teams in access transit or in paratransit because our volume has dropped significantly and ours is an on-demand service. We have cut some of our runs. We've asked some drivers to if they'd like to stay home voluntarily, and that's where we're at in those situations. We've upped our cleaning regimes. We are misting our buses inside every night. Every bus that's been on the road gets misted with the disinfectant every evening to get into those soft surfaces as well. And uh, continuing to encourage folks, wash hands, keep the social distance, um, and, and maintain those basic hygiene that you would maintain even in a regular flu situation. That's good. What we're seeing now this week of uh, this in the new week that we're in now, the week of uh, March 16th, 2020, is that a number of places have um, a number of governments have shut down restaurants and bars and telling them they can only do, uh, you know, call in service uh, or drive through service. It seems like the clampdown on society is happening. I know that a number of businesses now are telling their employees to work from home. Last week it was um, it was people were being you know offered the opportunity and this week uh, I've noticed a number of companies already have said, you know what we're just going to send everyone home that's non-essential. Uh, that doesn't need to be in our buildings in order to you know, promote the social distancing that's happening. And that, of course, is impacting ridership. We've got announcements this week from major systems like Las Vegas. They're cutting service on the Strip by half. The D.C. Metro service reduced bus and rail service and asked all their administrative employees to work remotely. Uh, St. Albert in Alberta said it will limit bus capacity to 50 percent. Green Bay is suspending some fixed route service. So while some systems are maintaining their full service, uh, others are realizing that they're having to dial it back to kind of match the demand. What's happening so far in your city? So in Saskatoon, our, we are maintaining service right now, but the decision to reduce service will come from the health authority or from our emergency measures office, and we'll work with them on that if it's needed. Uh, it will be based on what we have available for resources, so drivers, mechanics, uh, things like that. Um, We are just continuing to move ahead. We do have these plans in place in case we have to head that direction. But right now, as of my last meeting that ended about 20 minutes ago, it's status quo, continue uh, carrying on. In Saskatchewan here, anybody who has come into the province or returned home from travel as of March 13th, they are being asked to self-isolate. So right there, we're going to have some reductions in possibly drivers. 
schools have been closed. That was announced this morning. So public schools and Catholic schools have been closed effective Friday. So we're going to have probably some parents who no longer have childcare because their kids aren't in school. So that will probably affect our resources. So we're going to have to make some of these decisions, and we do have contingency plans in place to reduce service um, gradually, you know, but to a 75% level, 50% level as needed. And it is there, but right now we're still considering full service. Yeah. So on the paratransit side, because this is a um – a virus which they're saying affects you know elderly and people with underlying health conditions more. Is that impacting anything on the paratransit side? Are drivers saying anything or uh, any any thoughts on that? Our drivers are concerned, of course, and as you mentioned, it's concern for our customers more than it is for themselves. We did offer time off or, or cut some trips based on a reduced level of demand here today. So we actually cut nine runs and had uh, had nine drivers volunteer to stay home and take some time off, paid time off. It was banked time or things that were coming to them anyways, vacation yes. time. Uh, but we're going to continue to monitor that and cut trips and cut runs as needed where we can. But we continue to clean our buses. We're also spraying misting in those buses to give a full level of clean We're going to be cleaning our buses in between runs during the day. So maybe on an every other hour basis, we'll make sure everything gets a wipe down at the very least. Those touch points, of course. We're encouraging our drivers again, wash hands, wear your gloves, and continue on. Because you're right, in our paratransit service, we're in close contact with our customers, escorting them to and from the door and uh, providing that, that level of service. Yep. Very good. Is there anything else that you wanted to comment on? Not at this time. I think it's it's going to be uh it's going to be a day by day and I'm very thankful that we've got a great team who who are prepared for these. So, uh it's a lot easier to manage the the craziness when you've got a plan in place. That's right. Very good. Well, mm-hmm. and I, I know you're busy implementing that plan. So thank you for taking a few minutes today, Tracy Lowen, uh, who is the Access Transit Manager for Saskatoon Transit there in Canada, for sharing with us uh, all the great plans you guys are doing to handle this really tough situation. Thanks so very much for having me, Paul. We're now on to a global perspective here on Transit Unplugged on how transit and public transport across the world is uh, limiting the coronavirus risks and kind of what we can learn from all these efforts that are happening around the world. I'm excited to have with me today, Yale Wong, Research Associate from the Institute of Transport and Logistics Studies at University of Sydney. Pleased to be with you, Paul. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I read an article you wrote uh, today, Yale, and I was very impressed with You've seen what they're doing in places like China and other places and kind of pulling out of it some best practices uh, for public transport to respond to the coronavirus. Can you tell us some about those? Sure. I mean, the the gist of my article is about the need for the public transport sector to really step up in this critical time of need. I think a lot of the response that we've seen, um, certainly out in the West, has been very, uh, very reactive rather than proactive. So it's uh, been waiting on things like uh, evidence of a lot of community transmissions before we recommend things like face masks and the like. And certainly in the transport sector, I, uh, the, the feeling is, I'm afraid to say, uh, it's been caught a little bit um, on, the, on, on the back foot. So a lot of guidelines have been put out for a few months now, but it, it really doesn't go beyond that sort of... Um, uh, encouraging customers, people to to wash their hands, for instance, stay home if you're sick, which really doesn't do a lot in this um, in in uh, how we really ought to be responding to the outbreak. So what I'm trying to do is really um, putting out a call of action for more targeted, specific operational responses. Drawing on, for instance, what has been occurring in China, across in Asia, more enhanced cleaning, for instance, um, better ways that we can we we can do a kind of social social uh, isolation. It's it's very important because public transport is is one of the uh, lifebloods, the heartbeat of, um, of of the city. So so it's um, it's very important that uh, some policies be put in place in that in that particular sector. Yes, and and uh, that's what we've noticed when we've talked to folks from you know Memphis to Dallas to uh, Canada uh, to the Washington D.C. area. Several people who are on this podcast, they are all 
you have ramped up, you know, they're cleaning. Some of them are now doing cleaning multiple times, maybe every two hours on the vehicles. Drivers are minimizing their contact with customers. But tell us about uh, some of the best practices you've seen come out of China and places like that and how they were able to continue to use public transport, but just make it safer. Well, the first, um, the first thing to really note is um, in China, despite the uh, kind of lockdown throughout most of the country, it was really only in the epicenter in, in Wuhan and some of the cities around in its commuter belt that really saw a full shutdown of the uh, public transport system, where we saw buses sort of deployed and tasked with moving medical staff and delivering goods. Everywhere else, public transport was still running, but um, at, a, at a far more reduced uh, service, uh, service level. So some of the some of the press practices, a lot of cities they've really ramped up their their uh, cleaning sanitation regime. So in a in a city like like Shenzhen, for example, a city with the world's largest uh, electric bus fleet as well, as I'm sure you know them. Cleaning's been really undertaken after every every service trip at a trip level rather than at a run level, as we might see in a lot of places around the world. So there'd be a, a few staff of one or two sort of cleaners, the very rapid response type, come on, take about 10 minutes to sanitize, especially on the high touch areas. Very labor intensive, but uh, very um, conservative, I suppose, in terms of in terms of safety-wise. The buses aren't filled to more than 50% capacity, so a, a rule put in place, one person per, per seat, and there's uh, CCTV cameras used to used to enforce that. You'll see kind of floor markings in, in, in different places that are guiding sort of minimum distances between passengers, encouraging that social distancing. And a lot of, um, as, as well, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure you know the use of kind of QR codes to, to actually help and track the, the movement of people. So people encourage passengers, encourage to scan a QR code when they board a taxi or they're in a subway, metro car, or they're, they're, they're on a bus to, to help the authorities track where people are going. And if anyone comes up with uh, that, that they are, they have contracted the virus, then everyone that they are in their vicinity that they were contracted would get an almost real time instantaneous response uh, to be aware, maybe um, bring them open themselves over for, for, for testing as well. We've also seen um, some uh, more infrastructure wise um, kind of changes in, in Hong Kong. There's there's uh, some of the air-conditioned, uh, well, well, they're all air-conditioned, the, the, the buses, but they, they, they can be quite um, areas with poor ventilation. So actually uh, opening windows being, being retrofitted to help with that. And, and of course, more general things like in, in Hong Kong also robots, uh, cleaning robots have been used to to um, uh, on on the MTR on the on the underground railway to to to, to help with uh, cleaning efforts, and um, they were disinfecting the trains and the stations. That's right? correct. That's correct. Yes, that's correct. And and of course, a lot of public education campaign everywhere, uh, use uh, offering of uh, hand sanitizers to to customers and the like as well. All helps to 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 bring about a, a, a change in. In safety and sanitation. Right. Two, two things that stood out to me that you haven't covered were that um, systems in, I think it was in Hong Kong, were um, enhancing their cleaning of their air conditioned filters, which I thought was smart. And then the other one was in Europe, some transit agencies have closed off the use of the front door to reduce the possible infection risk for drivers. And the passengers mm. were now using just the rear door. That's interesting. That's right. Well, of course, in, in Europe, it's, it's less of a big change with the closure of the front door because a, um, a, a lot of places you go around in Europe, they already utilize sort of all door boarding and the lighting. And of course, a lot of customers prefer to use the rear door and you'll see buses pull in and they stop with the rear door for, for, for the passenger to, to, to use. But so closing off the front door and, and helping with uh, more more distance between the, the the crew, the driver, and the passengers is, is easy to achieve. That in other places, like in Australia, for instance, and I suspect North America as well, it might be harder to change some of these uh, some of these uh, everyday operational practices. For instance, in Australia, certainly a lot of um, a lot of operators they might not have a full uh, sort of read or they might have a half read or which really reduces that throughput a lot of because these buses are used for charter operations as well so they ma- maximize the number of seat, seating capacity inside so they might, might not have a read door and the other thing is of course a lot of stops it might be hard to get the read door close to the curb and also if you have a disabled passenger then they really need to uh, board in a light from the front door where there are uh, that ramp and kneeling mechanism in place yeah. 
So tell us, uh, in closing, tell us about what's happening in Australia where you're at, uh, because you're um, you're an associate there, uh, a research associate at the Institute of Transport and Logistics Studies at the University of Sydney. What's the response and what's happening with coronavirus generally in in uh, in Australia, and how is transit responding there? Well, I think the virus has well and truly reached Australia, and and it's reached Australia at a point where. In New South Wales, in the state where Sydney is, we're actually seeing a, a higher rate of infections per capita than most provinces in China outside of, of the epicentre, outside of Hubei. So it is well and truly reached uh, reached the country. There's a lot of panic setting in amongst the uh, amongst the community. A lot of uh, panic buying. You would have seen the the articles in in the press. The transport sector. Look, as of yesterday, um, our time, when, when sort of the article, my article was published, um, some of the transport agencies have ramped up some of the efforts. So, so credit, credit to them. So in South Australia, there's now going to be the bringing contractors to clean uh, buses, for instance, a public transport fleet three times a day, rather than just relying on when they go back to depot, to the depot overnight in Sydney. There's a, there's a response team that will be targeting the CBD uh, underground railway station. So, so there is um, things happening, but I would say that far more needs to be done. And I would also want to point out to some broader challenges that are not just operational in terms of, um, in terms of ensuring clean vehicles and minimizing the risk of infections, but also underlying kind of financial consequences for the public transport sector. So a lot of um, what we're seeing um, in the States, and especially I know, and, and, and in lots of places, uh, a lot of patronage decline because people don't want to use public transport. They'd rather be in their cars. Places, if they go into lockdown or a lot of working from home um, is, is happening, then that's going to be a real challenge for, 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 for transport operators. The operators here, they're on, they're on the urban public transport route operators. They were on gross cost contracts. So they're paid by kilometre regardless of a sort of patronage, um, the, the bums on the seats, if you will. So, so they're a bit more immune to, to those challenges. But of course, there'll still be cost uh, implications of, of high uh, cleaning efforts and the like. And the big question is, how do you actually incentivize through the contracts for these companies, these private operators that are contracted to government to actually go above and beyond what their remit is or what's specified in, in their contract? As you see, a lot of private companies actually actually doing. Um, but there are challenges. Um, there'll be challenges for the workforce. A lot of um, casual drivers, for instance, they, they, they won't have work. A lot of permanent might need to shift to part-time or have, or have, uh, or have less, uh, less, less hours of, of work if there's any service cutback, cutbacks. And there's also a lot of um, operators that operate commercially, charter operators, school bus operators, tourist operators, airport, shuttles, uh, hotel shuttles, a lot of them have already struggled through, I'm sure you know about the uh, summer of bushfires in, in, yes. in Australia that really put a dampener on tourism. And Australia was also very early to put on the, the travel ban for all, all people coming from China, um, where a lot of the tourist market is actually based. So there's been a big drop in um, tourist numbers in, in tour bookings. So a lot of these um, these commercial operators, I think, are, are really going to struggle, and you might end up seeing a lot of market consolidation and less competition in the in, in, in the public transport market as well. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this washes through the economy and through the transport sector in the economy as we move forward. Well, thank you, uh, Yale, for giving us a great review of what's been happening in some other countries around the world as agencies try to respond to the coronavirus. And it is a fast-changing environment. Uh, just, you know, in one week, we've seen dramatic changes across society. And so by the time people are listening to this in a day or two, there may be further changes. And we encourage them to continue to stay in tune with what the World Health Organization and others are, are recommending when it comes to containing the spread of this contagion. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Paul. I'm wishing you and all your listeners uh, very uh, safe and, and, uh, and good health as well in these challenging times. You've been listening to Transit Unplugged, powered by Trapeze Group. To stay up to date, subscribe on iTunes or Google Play, or join the conversation at transitunplugged.com. Thanks for listening.